All right, so we're moving on to the last few chapters of the Klein textbook, which cross over into biochemistry a little bit. But I like teaching this because if you have a solid understanding, it makes biochemistry a lot easier. The first chapter is all about carbohydrates, and carbohydrates are very important in biology, primarily because of this reaction where you take six CO2 molecules, react them with six water molecules, you take sunlight, this is my little sun, and what do you get out? Glucose. And if you think about glucose, you can draw it a few different ways. And we'll talk about why that's the case, but you can draw it in the open chain form, in which case it looks a lot like this. Or you can draw it in the closed chain form. And if you remember back to your pod, I actually asked you to show the reaction where it opens up and closes back down. The reality is it does that because glucose can act as both an aldehyde and a hemiacetal. So it really kind of depends on the form you're viewing in this case. Okay, so carbohydrates are really important energy storage um, for plants and animals. And plants, they uh, I will store it and use it as energy later on. And animals, we store it in our liver primarily as a polymer. And we'll talk about that. There's two main classes of carbohydrates, so let's take a look at those. And I'm not sure if many of you have seen this in your biology courses, but for some of you this may be review. And what I'm going to do is draw these using a Fisher representation, and if you remember Fisher representations, we've got this big long line with crossbars going through it. And I'm just going to draw a few example carbohydrates using Fisher representations. So here's one. And over here, I'll draw a separate one that looks very similar. This one up here has a CH2OH unit coming off of it. And when you look at these, the main difference is the functional group up top. On this one, quite clearly, we've got an aldehyde. So this is called an aldose. That's anytime you have an aldehyde. Versus over here, we've got a ketone, right? We've got a carbon on both sides of the carbonyl, so this is a ketose. These are the two main classes of carbohydrates. There's a few naming conventions we can use too. So for example, if we look at the aldose on the left, the carbon backbone is five carbons long, right? So this is referred to as an aldopentose. And basically, the pent just means it's five carbon backbone. Versus the one on the right, if we look at the one on the right, this would be a keto hexos. Because on this one, the carbon backbone actually has an extra carbon in it, it's six carbons long. Okay, so we can show these in the Fisher forms. There's a few things that are nice about the Fisher form. One is for all natural sugars, this lower OH will always be on the right hand side. So for natural D sugars, this OH is on the right. And you can see this is true over here as well. So it's always that bottom crossbar has the OH on the right when you're drawing it in the um, Fisher representation. 
One interesting tidbit of trivia is glucose is the sugar we normally think of when we think of biology, right? It was a big struggle to actually make the opposite handed glucose where that OH is on the left hand side. That's called uh, L-glucose, but synthetically they were able to make it. And it's fascinating because it tastes just like normal sugar, but it's zero calories. So there was a push for a while to figure out how to make it into an artificial sweetener because your body just simply doesn't know how to metabolize it when you switch that stereo center. The problem is it's like $100 a gram to make. So unless you are a billionaire, that's not a very practical artificial sweetener. All right, um, there's a huge number of different carbohydrates. I'm not gonna force you to memorize all of those, but um, there is a family tree listed in your textbook showing all of the different aldopentoses and all of the different ketohexoses. So for example, the one I have shown on the left here would be D-ribose. And the D, like I said, indicates that that OH is coming off the right-hand side. The one on the uh, right-hand side is D, and that's a specific type of ketohexose. All right, now if we think about it, we can ask ourselves really quickly, without looking at the family tree, how many different natural aldopentoses are there? So the one on the left. So I'm actually going to turn this into a review problem. So how many possible natural stereoisomers exist for aldopentose? So let's go and look back up at aldopentose, right? and identify the stereo centers that might vary. So for example, this is a stereo center that might vary, right? The red star there. This one might vary as well. What about this remaining one? No, we said that one's set naturally to always be on the right-hand side. So in terms of natural sugars, we don't need to worry about that one. That one's static. All right, so now we have to ask ourselves how many possible stereo isomers would they be? Yep. That's a good question. So the question was, is that middle star actually a stereo center? Because when you look at what's coming off each side, they look similar. But the reality is, if you continue along that change, they're, they're different. So it is a stereo center because eventually there's a difference. Yeah. So who remembers how we find the number of possible natural stereo isomers? Two to the n, right? So for that one, we could say there's two to the n, where this is the number of stereo centers. And just like we saw during first term, we could say 2 to the 2 equals 4 possible natural aldo pentoses. So there are quite a few different stereoisomers, especially for the longer carbohydrates. When you add more and more carbons, you're basically increasing the power of N on there. So those family trees do get pretty complicated. Like I said, I don't expect you to remember the names. However, your biochem teachers may want you to. All right, so let's go through and review Fisher projections really quick, because I know a lot of people are rusty on that. I taught you guys Fisher projections during first term, and I remember saying these really are only used for carbohydrates, and then we stopped using them for the rest of the year, and now we're seeing them again. So here we go. Let's redraw that aldopentose. So we'll draw ribose. If you remember all of the OHs for ribose, we're on the right. And if you remember all the way back to first term, what's going on with the vertical portion? 
Yeah, it's kind of curved away from you. So the way I described it was the cat tummy view, right? So the arms are sticking out towards you. The torso, though, is kind of arched back. So the tummy view. So <laughs> let's draw the carbon backbone. So the whole vertical portion is curved back, right? So vertical equals curved back. I didn't draw the center ones as dashes, otherwise it looks kind of confusing, so I kept those kind of static. But you get the idea. Everything's curved back into a C going into the page. And then the horizontal portion, like I said with the cat analogy, are like cat paws sticking out towards you. So we'd have these bow ties essentially with an OH coming off each right hand side. Oops, sorry, these should all be hydrogens. I was hurrying. Here we go. Hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So now we've got our kind of, oh, and they should be wedges. Holy cow. My brain is tired after this long weekend. Sorry about that. You know, just partying. There we go. That looks way better. <laughs> okay, so now we've got our bow ties for the horizontal portion, the cat legs sticking out. Now I've got a task for you. I want you to help me find the stereo center there. Is it R or S? Yeah. All right, so let's go through and do this. Highest priority, this should be easy. OH, right? So first attached atom is always what you look at. Don't worry about anything else besides that first attached atom. Oxygen clearly beats out the carbons and the hydrogens in this case. All right, now we've got a situation though. So for example, we've got this carbon here and we've got this carbon here. So if you remember going back to first term, if you have a tie, what do you do? You look at the attached atom. So let's do the top one first. That top carbon is attached to one oxygen, a second ghost oxygen, and then third would be the hydrogen. What I like doing is ordering these from heaviest to lightest atom, right? All right, down below, if we look at that carbon, that carbon is attached to an oxygen with the OH. It's attached to a carbon underneath it, and then it's attached to a hydrogen on the left-hand side, right? So now we've mapped these. What you do is you'd say, all right, here and here, it's a tie. So then you move to the next heaviest atom, and you'd say, all right, here I've got oxygen. Oxygen is heavier than carbon, which is second for that bottom one. Therefore, this oxygen is going to be the winner, and that means this will be priority two. All right, conversely, that means that this must be priority three, and the hydrogen, by definition, must be priority four. So now we go around, we're going counterclockwise. It looks like an S, but is it? Yeah, the H is a wedge. Like I said, if your lowest priority is a wedge and not a dash, you need to flip your assumed priorities. So in this case, this would be an R stereo center. So make sure you do remember how to do R and S for Fisher projections. It's something that's easy to forget. It's something that's easy to rush. But do it slowly and try to pencil out the tiebreakers if that helps. All right. So let's briefly review a little bit of what we saw in our aldehyde and ketone chapter. If you remember, in our aldehyde and ketone chapter, we said you could have certain aldehydes where under specific pH ranges, these aldehydes will actually attack themselves as long as they've got a nucleophile around form this unique functional group. Does anybody remember what this is called?
So hemiacetal. If I were to put this on the next exam, raise your hand honestly if you think you could do this mechanism. A couple people. All right, for practice, let's do the mechanism. Let's try to figure out how this works just in case this shows up on the next exam. Really, this is just like a normal sugar. I just didn't show all of the other OH groups. So it's important to remember that this is just like a normal carbohydrate. Yep, and in this case, if we think about it, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. That nucleophile that I labeled one can attack into that carbonyl on the aldehyde. Ideally, you want to form a five or a six-membered ring. No, it's relatively straightforward. Who thinks they got it? All right, so let's quickly do this as a class just for a review. First step, what will that be? Protonate your carbonyl. So in this case, your aldehyde's oxygen will steal a proton. All right, and like I said, the oxygen labeled as one is six positions away from that carbonyl carbon. Now that carbonyl carbon is super electrophilic because that resonance structure you can draw where you pull up electron density due to the oxygen. So this can really quickly attack into itself. And just like we saw, you can now have a situation that looks like this. And last step would just be deprotonation. So I'll just write minus H plus to give us our hemiacetal. It's important to remember when you do this reaction that you're actually creating a new stereocenter, right? So if you think about this, we've created a new stereocenter right there. So this could be an R or an S. And we see this with carbohydrates, too. If you saw we have carbohydrates, especially the aldehydes, these can do the uh, nucleophilic attack by one of their tail alcohols and cyclize up into a, a ring system. However, one of their stereocenters, when they do that, can either be R or S. So let's take a look at this with glucose. Not racemic, because if you remember, racemic mixture means you have an equal mixture of enantiomers. But carbohydrates, for the most part, have other stereocenters too that we haven't flipped or mirrored. Yeah, so we'll talk about the differentiation too. So let's take a look at glucose. And I'm going to draw the Fischer form first. This time we have four crossbars. So one, two, three, four. And then down here we always have that CH2OH tail. For glucose, we've got two OHs on the right, followed by an H, followed by an OH. So this is glucose, specifically D-glucose. Like I said, we can tell it's D because that OH is on the right-hand side. And if you treat this with, let's say, aqueous acid under buffered conditions, you can get this to cyclize, and what I'm going to do is draw it in the chair conformation. So there's this, and with glucose, that CH2OH tail actually comes off the top like that. 
that OH is going to be equatorial. This OH is going to be equatorial, and this OH is going to be equatorial. And what I like to do is to highlight my carbon. So for example, up here I'm going to highlight this carbon as my green carbon. I know. So I'm going to add that in. That green carbon from the aldehyde is located right there. And like I said, the OH group coming off of there can be axial or equatorial. You'll get a mixture of both. So what I'm going to do is cheat through the power of technology and copy this. And one of them will draw one that's both axial and equatorial coming off that green position. Okay, so now we've got both of those drawn. This one, for example, is going to be OH that's axial. Then the one on the right, I'm going to stick it out here and make sure that that is equatorial. So like I said, we're scrambling that stereo center coming off of that green carbon when the OH attacks in. The interesting thing to remember is that this OH is actually doing the attacking, not the OH on the bottom. And why is that? So why is that circled OH being the nucleophile? What was that? Yeah, it forms a six-membered ring, right? If we use, let's say, this oxygen down there, we would get a seven-membered ring, which thermodynamically isn't very favorable. So nature does a good job of selecting that six-membered ring due to thermodynamics. Okay, so that alcohol zips in. We get the scrambling of different stereocenters. What we call this carbon is the anomeric carbon. Let me fix this. And it's always going to be that carbon that's next door to the oxygen in your ring system, but not the carbon that has that CH2OH. And it's specifically, it was a carbon that used to be a part of that aldehyde. So now when we look at these two different ring closed forms, we have to describe them. And the one on the right-hand side, we know that position is alpha, or sorry, is axial, so we call this alpha D-glucose. And specifically, alpha equals axial OH, right? So this OH that's coming off there is axial. Okay, the one on the right, on the other hand, is equatorial. So this is called beta D-glucose. And this is for an equatorial OH. So up here we said that that OH is equatorial. All right, now the weird thing. Which of these do you think is more stable, the one on the left or the one on the right? What was that? The one on the right. Yeah, most people would say the one on the right looks more stable. It's actually wrong. <laughs> this gets into this weird theory called the anomeric effect. That oxygen in the ring system is actually stabilizing the OH when it's axial, not when it's equatorial. And that gets into weird molecular orbital theory that we're not going to talk about in this class, but it has to do with anti-bonding orbitals. But it is kind of weird that we teach you in OCHEM that axial is never favored, but this is the one weird exception to that rule. All right, when we're looking at these two different ring closed forms, we don't call them enantiomers. Why not? Yeah, we only flipped one of the stereo centers. So what would these be called? Diastereomers. diastereomers, exactly. So if we look at these, these are diastereomers. That differ at the anomeric position. They're not enantiomers, which is what students often think. To be an enantiomer, you have to flip every single stereocenter. In this case, we only flipped that one. All right? Because these are so common in biochemistry, these are just simply referred to as anomers. They're 
there is special type of stereoisomers that differ only at that anomeric carbon for carbohydrates. Yep. So I've seen sapling pond uh, where uh, we do the uh, you know, visual uh, projection here. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see the D is all, has its only always pointed to the right. But what about the uh, the rest of the left side? Because sometimes O H is like split from left to right, and I can't. That's a good question. So. The question was, how do we know if the OHs are on the left or the right? It depends on the identity of the sugar. So if they ask you a specific sugar name, you may need to actually pull out a reference table and say like, oh, they're talking about ribose. The top ones need to be on the right and left in this specific order. You may need to reverse Yeah, you may have to do that. If I give you something on an exam, I will give you some sort of reference or cheat sheet or just flat out give you the sugar. I'm not that interested in you memorizing the names because they're not systematic. Yeah. All right, does that make sense? All right, there's a couple different ways that you may have seen sugars drawn. Organic chemists like to draw them in chair conformations or Fisher projections, but I'll show you another way that biologists like to show it. And this is with the Haworth projection. Whoops. And I'll show you some simple tricks for converting these. So now let's take glucose in its closed chain form. Sorry, that looks messy already. Okay, so we've got our chair structure with the oxygen in there. I'm going to do my OH here. All right, is this alpha D-glucose or beta D-glucose? And how can we tell? It's beta, right? So we know that this is our anomeric OH. We know that the green positions are anomeric carbon. So this would be beta D-glucose. All right, with the Haworth projection, what you're essentially going to do is imagine viewing it on its side. So. All right, so imagine your eyeball is going to view this from the side. And the way they do this is essentially by having a hexagon where the front ones look kind of bolded, meaning they're pointed towards you. And then the back ones look more solid like that. And then you got bars pointed up and down like this. All right, so those are sticking up and sticking down from the side, right? So let's go through and kind of color code my carbons. Like I said, the anomeric carbon is always going to be right here. So I'll label that green. And then I'll say one, two, three, four, and then five. So one, two, three, four, and five. It doesn't really matter how you number it. I'm just doing it so we can keep track. All right, so for position one, is the OH going to be down or up? So this position. Yeah, it would have to be pointed down, right? Because if you think about the chair per chair conformation, you would have an axial OH sticking up. So that would be in the up position. So we'd say, all right, OH would be sticking up. Or sorry, the H would be sticking up. The OH would be sticking down. OK, what about position two? Is the OH going to be down or up? Up. Because we know over here, the hydrogen's pointed down in the axial position. OK, so now we've got the OH sticking up. Position 3, is the OH sticking down or up? Down, which means the hydrogen's sticking up. All right, position 4, is the CH2OH sticking up or down? Oh. Up, OK. That means uh, assumed hydrogen sticking down like that. And then we go over to the anomeric carbon. Is the OH going to be sticking up or down? Yeah, it would have to be sticking up because we know that the assumed hydrogen there would be sticking down. So biologists, I like to tease them. They're not very good at drawing chairs. They prefer to draw it this way. I personally think it looks like a mess drawing it this way. It's very confusing, but I do want you to know how to interpret going back and forth. Um, so 
If anything, try to get good at remembering your chair structures because that's what you see primarily in organic chemistry. Does that make sense? So the Haworth projection is the one on the right. That's really common with DNA and RNA to show it that way just because it's a little bit more compact. It's a little less overwhelming to look at. All right, so now let's try to get through some of our definitions before class ends. The first one we already went over, that was alpha, OH coming off anomeric carbon. Is it axial or equatorial? It is axial. Beta is where the OH coming off the anomeric carbon is equatorial. So those are two very important ones in carbohydrate chemistry. We saw anomers already. And we said that they are diastereomers. That differ only at the anomeric position. So that's pretty easy to remember. We also have another term called epimer, similar to anomer. These are diastereomers as well. They're diastereomers that differ only at one stereocenter. not the anomeric carbon. So some other stereo center has been flipped, but all the other ones are the same. Yep? Yeah, so DNL would be an example of epimers, and we'll talk more about that later. All right, the last one we're going to define, or actually I've got a few more if we have time, is muto rotation. Muto rotation is the ability to flip between your alpha and beta form. And really, muto rotation only occurs if you have an OH present on the anomeric carbon. So basically, that's that process of ring closing and ring opening. All right, we do have two more, but these are quick. I wanted to get them knocked out before tomorrow. First one is pyranos. This is a six-membered ring. Containing oxygen. So for example, the glucose. Uh, chair conformation that we were looking at was six-membered ring. It had oxygen as one of those members. This is different than furanose. These are five-membered rings. Containing oxygen. Like I said before, five and six membered rings are your most stable rings. You really don't see seven or four. Those are thermodynamically too unstable to.